Open your eyes. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back to a magical, mystical episode of the Untitled Marvel Project. I'm your host, Tanner Dykstra, joined as always by my sorcerer's apprentices on UMP, uh, Abram Buner and Tucker Hazel. Uh, but uh, we're not reviewing Disney's The Sorcerer's Apprentice, of course, we're reviewing <laughs> Marvel's Doctor Strange. But before yeah. we get into it, I want you to subscribe to Backlog Banter if you're not already. I want you to like this video if you haven't already. And if you're not in the Discord already, you can join that. That link is in the description there. You can talk about Marvel movies. You can talk about non-Marvel movies. You can talk about video games. Literally anything under God's... I'm iffy on that one. God's, anything on God's green earth you can talk about. And beyond. We, 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 ex we blow past the bounds of earthly shackles, okay? Holy so, shit. Yes. Later you review on Friday. True. True. Yeah. But, fellas, I was instructed before we started recording that uh, Tucker would like to go last and Abram would like to go second to last, so I guess that leaves me to go first with my thoughts on 2016's Doctor Strange. Yeah. And Doctor Strange is a great movie. I'll say it right here. Before re-watching it this time, I was like, yeah, Doctor Strange, thumbs up from me. But now, I'm going to double that thumbs up. This movie gets two thumbs up That's for me. That's twice the thumbs up. It's twice the thumbs up. I think this movie I'll is... I'll tell you, we're going to stick both those thumbs, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me finish, let me finish before you tell me where, where to stick those thumbs, okay? So, uh, you know, it, it's always, like, in the Marvel ether that, like, oh, yeah, Doctor Strange has some really creative visuals, and Benedict Cumberbatch is what? pretty good and stuff like that. All, all these, like, sort of lukewarm to fairly positive uh, things you can say about Doctor Strange. Coming out of Doctor Strange, I came out pretty hot and high on off of all those concepts, and uh, I'd really enjoy to, uh, I'd really enjoy breaking all those down after I hear the comments from you two fellas, which I feel are going to be less positive than mine. I think this more movie is terribly boring. Wow. I think this movie is terribly, terribly boring. And so as I said before, this is the only Marvel movie I've never finished prior to UMP because I fell asleep in it. And boy, howdy, was I fighting for my fucking life the second time around too. Here's the thing about Doctor Strange. Okay. And I, cause I have a lot of things to praise it on actually. First of all, they're able, they're able to both get and squander wonderful actors, which is quite, quite, <laughs> a, quite an accomplishment. It's not, it's, it's, but my, my actual praise, no backhanded element to it here, mm -hmm. is that Doctor Strange is one of the few times, I think, period, when I have ever been, like, wowed by CGI. Mm -hmm. where, I've ever, where I've ever seen CGI that, like, expands my understanding of how you can use this as a tool for filmmaking. Sure. Yeah. I think this is so far beyond Inception. I know that that's the, you know, the, the likely comparison to draw, but it is so visually inspired in those fight sequences that it really is. It's almost funny that this is a Marvel movie because we talked mm -hmm. about Marvel movies being so safe, so homogenized, right? But this is a level of creativity, I think, that blows past a lot of the MCU visually and blows yeah. past a lot of blockbuster filmmaking on the whole. So I think that that is really, really worthwhile of praise. I think the characters are so boring. I think the plot is really boring. And I just find that it is a lot of style and little substance. I can't buy into Stephen Strange. I don't really care about the side characters. I think that Kamertaj is full of so many exciting ideas, but it's such a, such a rote origin story. Ignore the voice crack. Mm. Com that combined with all this is like mystical shit in the background that I end up just finding myself pretty bored by the progression of the movie and sticking around because I am wowed when buildings I start to do this and then they do that and then they come back up here because that really is stunning a stunning achievement with a usually you know uninteresting tool in my opinion yeah as usual I sit between the two of you oh. I, that's why I wanted to go last I just wanted to say I thought it'd be fun oh, okay. no, uh, I see. but I, I'm, I'm probably a little more positive than Abram on this, but I I agree with everything he said there. I mean, mm. this is basically the only Marvel movie where I think that categorically the fights are the best part. The 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 uh, creativity in uh, shot composition and use of CGI blows every element of this film, other element of this film, out of the water. And I think that maybe when I'm watching this, I feel, man, they put in so much effort towards the fights and the CGI. 
maybe they forgot to put in the effort everywhere else. Because I, I, I agree with Abram. I think that the characters and the plot, which is most of this movie, are are really just boring. And and while I, I am visually impressed and engaged while I'm watching Doctor Strange, it doesn't really stick with me because I don't care about the characters. I mean, I think the only character I find compelling is the Ancient One. But uh, other than that, don't Stephen Strange is... I, I, I feel like a lot of my problems with him in uh, Multiverse of Madness apply here. He's just not a particularly interesting main character. I feel like the side characters are all underutilized. Really bland villain. And, yeah, I, I really think that the, the, the fights are all that this movie has going for it, frankly. All right, well, let, let's start with uh, where, we're, where we're all positive. How about that? And then we'll progress sure. into the characters. Let's yeah. talk about the Into visual... where we're all negative. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Not quite. Not quite, Tucker. But let's start off on a positive note. Because I think we would all agree that this is, up until this point in the MCU, and maybe overall, the most visually creative and uh, just uh, out-of-the-box Marvel movie that we've gotten up until yeah. this point and, and forward. Because... I love all the wibbly wobbly nonsense. I just love that shit. I love when yeah. buildings are folding in on each other. I love the mirror dimension. People throwing mirror shards at each other. I love walking on the side of a building and then you curve, you cover on the other side of the building. I love when you jump off the side of one of those buildings and then you land with your feet on the opposite one. I love all that stuff. Yeah, I really do it all great. the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love doing it. My favorite activity. I think the reason why it's great, and I, God forbid I bring up games here in UMP, but I want to think for a second about Super Mario Galaxy. Like, that game, like, turned people's minds inside out because what it did is it made walking around, like, spherical environments make sense in your head. It became intuitive. And because there's always a sense that, like, when Mario jumped and he landed somewhere else, it made sense. And I think what's so special with Doctor Strange is that your mind is being completely fucking melted. But at the same time, there's such a fluidity to the way that the characters like fall off of buildings and land on new ones and the ways that like pieces of Manhattan like flip past each other and then you land somewhere else. There's the, like these sequences were so well blocked out that even though your mind is like, whoa, what's going on? Mm -hmm. we're, we're still fighting. It's There's still a sense of like groundedness to it because you, you see how they transition around the buildings. Like I love moments when... I think about um, when we're in the uh, the New York Sanctum and, and Strange is fighting off Mads Mikkelsen and his and his jabronis, right? And they're, they're walking on the hallway and the hallway flips and you're following the camera flip and you see Doctor Strange going from running on the ground to mm -hmm. a, like Uncharted 2-esque grabbing onto that thing on that used to be a, do a doorway, but now it's a ledge up. Like it is so well conceptualized on a practical level that yeah. it mends like this, melds this conceptual like mind fuckery with a real sense of choreography in place. And that's super, super hard to do. Yeah, I think that what makes these fights stand out from everything else we've seen in, in the MCU, and I'm going to make a claim, what rewatching this movie made ret retroactively uh, explains why I was disappointed with so much of the fight choreography in Multiverse of Madness, is because what Doctor Strange's fights... The, movie, the fights in this movie focus on is changing the environment around the characters and constantly having the characters react to changing environments because they're all using magic and they're all fucking things up and things are going crazy. And, and if someone breaks a hole in the mirror dimension, then boom, everyone else has to deal with that. And that makes it feel really kinetic and visually interesting. And then, you know, Multiverse of Madness... They throw music notes at each other. You know, uh, that's... Tucker. We're not talking about multiverse of madness but, in this. But... We're talking about Doctor Strange. <laughs> I, I'm just trying. To, I'm just trying to say, like that. In my mind, these sequences are what I think of Doctor Strange. It's him astral projecting. It's going into the mirror dimension, doing these crazy things, using time, and he, he uses a whip <laughs> in the sequel. He uses a lot more than a, I don't want to get tape. bogged down in multiverse but... of madness talk. But he uses a lot more than a whip to. to let's, let's let's be fair here. I feel. I feel. I am. To, but but I'm trying to praise this movie because I do think that it is it is what makes Doctor Strange's identity so unique is is focusing for fights and the creative creativity of fights on an ever changing environment and, and and that is always really kinetic and interesting to follow. All I will say is that I I don't I like Multiverse Madness way fucking more than this movie, but I also think Tucker is right. I think that there's a much stronger sense of of identity to the fights here than there is in Multiverse. Yeah, sure. yeah but because of the wibbly wobbly nonsense, the 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 inceptionizing yes. of things like in things like that. Um, I just love. I think it's really integrated with the introduction of this magic system and showing you know people in 2016 that 
this is completely divorced and completely on a different level than everything else we've been dealing with. Yeah. When we, I just like scenes mm. like um when Doctor Strange is still like trying to figure out how all this nonsense is working, but he's but he's you know he's he's a very smart guy, so he's like okay, I'm gonna use this like door that I can switch from you know the ocean to the desert to the jungle or whatever. I'm gonna yeah. use that to my advantage. Kick one of these MFs through that door, switch it over. I I love that stuff, and it, it, it that yeah. plays off of the flipping that you know flipping the hallway up on up to its side and using yeah. the Uncharted two ledge as, as Abram said. Um, but th I think this visual creativity uh, extends into other areas as well, not just the fight scenes, but also, I mean, people constantly, constantly use clips from that, you know, ancient one touches his forehead and he goes, yeah. and he goes on into to space, a, into wibbly wobbly world, into the fucking yeah. quantum zone. It's fucking he, crazy. He, his hands are sprouting other hands and then sprouting other hands and he goes into the dark dimension and all these crazy things. And there's the, there's the not like the weird space where all the arms crawl out and grab him and like tuck him into the, himself. Uh, I wish it was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that one of the maybe, uh, more forgotten sequences, but I think is for me what the one that sticks out the most is not the time rewinding Dormammu battle, though that mm -hmm. is that is an also pretty visually interesting. But is what comes before that, which is uh, Wong, uh, Wong, Strange, and Mordo um, fighting off Mads Mikkelsen and his fucking cronies, mm -hmm. while Hong Kong is rewinding. Time is yes. rewinding. Things yes. are flying, flying backwards. People are running backwards. He has to dodge cars that are going backwards. That is Tenet six years before Tenet. And, and it, like it, it still works just as well. Like I, I think that that one's not talked about as much because the mirror dimension is like the most creative thing about this. Um, but for me, for me, it, it is the thing that sticks out most in my mind. Absolutely. Yeah. I also, I also want to shout out the the Alster projection uh, hospital fight against yes, uh, uh, against, uh, against Scott <laughs> Scott Atkins guy <laughs> man uh, disciple of of uh, Caecilius. Uh, that's the that's the villain's name. Yes, maybe uh, it is. It, it's kind of serious, you know. It uh, is. Uh, it is uh, confirmed. We confirmed it here on UMP. Yeah, let me, let me first. check that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'll right here that. first, folks. None of you have heard the name of the villain from this fucking movie. What do we but have to do? I, I like. I, I love him like using the uh, like the the paddles of life to like explode Scott Adkins uh, using some sort of energy force soul i thought the, the paddles of life was a fucking like uh comic <laughs> no. relic no. but you meant like the the zappy pad dr zappy pads that's what they're called oh the that's what they're called excuse me defibrillator thank you thank you thank god you, damn it why do you gotta ruin the joke abram <laughs> yeah bringing these medical terms in here but uh, but also you know if i may if i may just dip my toe into praising a character moment for a second i think that's a really fun moment between him and christine is him like popping out of the uh, out of the astral realm being like hit me with it again she's like what you don't need it and he's like just trust me Shoot me like grabs cut scott adkins in a bear hug uh to, to blow him up i think God, it's fun. It me yeah <laughs> Tucker just wants a hug. That's what we're learning from this UMP episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I, I think that talking about Scott At Atkins and the fact that, you know, I know Kaiselius' name. Abram obviously didn't. You <laughs> you struggled for ha a, a half a second to remember yep. it. I, I think brings us to the villains, which I sure. think are probably the weakest part of this film. And, yep. and connected to the plot uh, are why I find this film hard to um, gravitate to, to, to get invested in. Because... I, I will say that I think that the the main characters are better than the villains. So we'll you know we're going we're going down to the bottom of the barrel here. We'll pop back up a little bit. Um, but I really do think that the explanation for Caecilius and Dormammu and his cronies and all of this feels so backgrounded because it's incredibly underdeveloped. And while they do feel like a threat because they're blowing up sanctums and stuff, I never feel like I, I feel like Mads. Mickelson, as the the talented actor that we know that he is, is underutilized in this role because his character isn't very well written or very well defined. Yeah, I, I think Mads Mickelson's a badass. He he's he's le chiffre, mm -hmm. and and, and so that true. and that is like he is imposing. He can be imposing just as a man in a suit with a little bit of blood coming out of his eye. So when mm -hmm. you put him in this like this cool like Witcher 
ponytail and then you make his eyes all fucked up and he's just hanging out there and he's killing guys sucker i do think he feels like a threat because he's just killing guys right sure Mm. he's chopping heads off yeah i i think that he does end up feeling like like a real presence but i but i think that there's nothing really under it and that's why it Mm. comes back to me the, the, the the tired old cliche of style over substance but I think that certainly applies to his character also, because as soon as he's like, he's like put in the, in the fucking exoskeleton yeah. jail mm-hmm. suit and he starts to, does a nice little robot dance, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah. And as soon as he starts blathering on about whatever he's talking about, it, it really comes into focus to me that like, I don't care. <laughs> and, but I think that's a script issue, right? Yeah. Because there is so much richness to commertage, and I kind of like the like, like the fucking Harry Potter trope of like, oh, there's the hidden stuff in the library. I'm gonna go find it out, right? Like I watched. I like seeing Doctor Strange develop in, in that way. I think that's one of the only times that I end up caring about his character mm. is is seeing him develop that way. But it's like I don't care about or, or have the capacity. To, maybe I'm just stupid. But I don't have the capacity to understand and empathize with this like dormammu dark ages time and infinite mm-hmm. life mortality exposition being thrown at me and i and i think it's there when you're supposed to like resonate with strange like oh i'm being lied to by the ancient one right but i just feel like i'm just sitting there listening to maz megelson talk nonsense at me mm-hmm. and i think that's a major issue with the film yeah uh, I don't disagree with you guys. I, I, I think this is probably the point where, um, you know, all, all of our dislike of this element of the film will line up pretty closely. And I think it is, you know, an issue of this is this is an origin film, and it falls into a common trope of not only MCU films, but but um, like fantasy action sci-fi films as a whole. That is. We're introing you to this world, and it's at stake. It's immediately at stake. All right, the the world is literally going to explode and become the dark dimension or whatever. And here's all these concepts, and here's all this lore, and here's the big villain, and he is the ultimate force of darkness in the world. Blah, 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 blah. And and you're like, holy mother of God. Okay, I'll, I'm I'm trying to absorb all of this, and this world I just got introduced to is at stake. Great, perfect. Um. And you know, this film doesn't have a lot of ties outside of you know an offhanded mention or two to the to the previous MCU films. So mm-hmm. I think that is also maybe uh you know maybe undermines this like you caring about the world being at stake and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it is an origin story issue as well. Um, but talking more closely about Caecilius, yeah, I mean he. It, it, the whole thing about him calling out hypocrisy against the Ancient One for channeling powers from the Dark Dimension to extend her life uh, and, and stuff like that is interesting, I think. Uh, and maybe if they had played that up more, uh, that, that it, it, it would have been a bit stronger. And if Caecilius wasn't so blatantly evil and wanting to channel, uh, not, wanting, not wanting to bring in the guy who's going to destroy the world, I'm like, okay, you might have a, more of a point if you weren't literally trying to destroy the Earth. Yeah. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, and I think, it, you know, I think that sort of hypocrisy thing that he calls out plays into something that the ancient one says that I sort of see as a theme of this film and as a, a, a character theme in Doctor Strange across several films, which is you got to break a few eggs. That's kind of that's kind of Doctor Strange's whole mantra is that, yeah, it's for the greater good, grand calculus of the universe, you got to break a couple eggs. And he gets that here uh, in his role as Sorcerer Supreme True. from the yeah. ancient one. She's like, hey, listen, was it a bad thing to channel power from the dark dimension? Yeah, probably. But like, I- I'm the ancient one. I'm the, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm doing things. I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm making deals. I'm out here making I'm moves. Out, I'm out here making money moves and uh, things are going pretty good. So looks like it all worked out. Sometimes you got to break a few eggs. Yeah. And uh, that, like, that ties into a, a side character thing where she's like, you know, if Mordo or whoever was the source of Supreme, things we would have lost already, just because he's not willing to harness that power for the use of good. Um, and I and I think that is you know a, a character thing that we can maybe talk about. But as it stands, yes, Caecilius is not a great villain. Mads Mikkelsen criminally underused in this film. Yeah. Dormammu, neat, uh, but only really because of the Dormammu I've come to bargain ending uh, yes. thing. So there's yeah. that. I, I've got I've got two things to say about Mads that I think will bring this uh, problem into a greater, more clear light. Is I think the reason why I said he didn't feel like a threat isn't mm. because Mads Mikkelsen doesn't have a presence in the film, but because 
the the character of Caecilius is shown in an opening sequence and then forgotten about for an hour and ten minutes of the film. And then he shows back up and suddenly we have to dive right back into this. Mm -hmm. And not only so not only does he not feel like a presence for an hour and ten minutes of the film, which is most of the film, because he's literally not there and there. only mentioned offhand and offhandedly mm -hmm. a few times, he also is a very impersonal villain. He has a tie to the ancient one who's like a B tier character, but other than that, like no, Strange doesn't know who he is. Strange like has never met him before. What yeah. the two of them be? And then it's like, oops, uh, you're the bad guy. We're gonna fight now. And I yeah. think one of the reasons why the the way that the best Marvel villains work is when they have that personal connection, and you can feel the tension between the characters, not only on a superhero action level, but on a personal level as well. But I feel no personal connection to to Strange and Caecilius because there there isn't one. They're they're like explicitly they have never met Talk, before or, Tucker, or heard of each other. <laughs> are you telling me that you don't feel a, a deep personal connection to the family that Caecilius lost that we never saw and get and gets mentioned once? <laughs> Eesh, I, I, I forgot about that, yeah. That's why that's why he wants to do this whole thing and like harness the power of like the no time in the dark dimension so he can bring his oh, family back. Oh so he's, he's kinda like the Scarlet Witch but mm, worse. <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> Uh yeah. Any thoughts, Abram, on anything there? I must. I also think Dormammu's dumb. Oh yeah. no! Like, well, I think I think Dormammu and Madge. The well, last thing I want to say is the yeah. thing is he he is a presence, but he's so cartoonishly over the top. End of the world. Dormammu, you mean? Dormammu, and yeah. then by subsequent okay. Madge. Like, I don't feel like he's that because cartoonish over the top bullshit. Like, yeah, the world's gonna end. Fucking wahoo! Like, it's because there's no the personal way. threat. Yeah. yeah. The, the, my problem with Dormammu is like. I like the moment of showing up in Hong Kong and being like, oh shit, it's already too late. And then he yeah. goes, shooing, uh, uh -huh. yeah. which is very cool. But when we actually go into, we go through like the 2001 Space Odyssey Technicolor portal. Yeah. Jack you know, Kirby, very, very yeah. Jack Kirby inspired Definitely. Dark Dimension. Yeah. You know. And we show up there and it's just like this big, like fucking face. Yeah. Yep. And it goes, Dormammu, I've come to bargain. And Which Dormammu's I think, bad. Yeah, I think I think the line Dormammu have come to bargain has been ruined by just it being taken out of context. But I think it is I don't know if I don't I don't know if it's a good line or not. But but I think having this big fucking evil guy Dormammu be completely unable to stop Doctor Strange and yeah. basically at a certain point just becoming a huge like confusing joke bit completely robs him of any way that he probably already wouldn't have had as like a dark side-esque figure mm. of like hey he's just like a big evil guy and he wants to fucking destroy the planet you know now it's just hey he's a big evil face and dr strange is going to make him into a joke and it's yeah. okay but like it doesn't again tanner I, I like your point about all of a sudden there being these huge stakes in the world right mm. it doesn't really work for me not only because it's i'm tr i'm trying to acclimate to all this but also because like the villain's not doesn't scare me he doesn't seem like he scares dr strange you know yeah yeah i think that's a big problem. He, he, yeah he also like almost doesn't scare the other people because ancient one seems to know that things are probably going to work out fine because strange is going to be the sorcerer supreme and then like maybe maybe he scares mordo and but like we don't know or and maybe he scares wong but we never see wong like really react mm. to the things and, and i think he also is a, another symptom of exactly what i said about about uh Kaecilius is Shows up too late, doesn't have a presence for like basically the entire of the movie, uh, except for a couple offhand mentions, and then mm. also isn't a character. Let's be real; like it, he's a force, and anything mm. uh, necessarily so, but that force having a face and being a character, but not being really... voiced by Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> yeah, which you true? can't tell. <laughs> no, he, yeah, he, he is so but you fucking can't modulated. Tell. I don't know that. Um, uh, I think why I give this ending credit, the Dormammu have come to bargain thing, is that I think. Uh, having having gone through forty some MCU projects now, uh, or yeah, th I think we're on thirty something. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I think I agree. Uh, <laughs> I think I give this ending credit because it's not shooting lasers, punching people, sure. yada yada yada. On a conceptual I, I, level, absolutely. Yes, that's why I love the ending of Loki so much, and to a lesser extent, that's why I like this ending. It is Doctor Strange realizing that. I cannot take on a force that is older than time itself. So I'm going to... I, and I, this is maybe some editorializing from people after the fact, looking back on this, but I like these sort of ideas that 
Dormammu has never experienced time and or time loops, and that's why he's so off put by this. He that's why he is so you know sensitive to being imprisoned in this time loop. Is that because he's never experienced anything like that? Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm I, sure that's that's intended. Yeah. You know, subsequently, I also like the idea that Doctor Strange is so you know doggedly uh you know in in pursuit of his plan and like saving the Earth that he spent. 40,000 years in the dark dimension in this time loop uh in in total um which i think maybe the director has said i don't really remember but i like both of these ideas and i think they come out of this concept of he's not shooting him with a big laser or hitting yeah. with a hitting with a firecracker whip or a firecracker shield or anything like that mm -hmm. he's using the the time stone that he just acquired and his little, his intellect yeah sure absolutely true yes i i think but all that comes down to concept for me. Yeah. I, I think that if Dormammu had felt like more of a threat, more of a presence, and we'd seen, maybe we'd seen a, another part of the world, or even a, like maybe the Ancient One shows us another dimension where where uh, the the dark dimension is taken over, and all the lives of these people are lost, and maybe maybe that's where one of the characters' families died or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think there should have been a more personal connection to the danger of the dark dimension, other than I live on Earth. And it's dark dimension, not too good for Earth, not too, not too great for those people living in Hong Kong. So, yeah. But uh, so I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, Doctor Strange's intellect a a as an element of his characters, and I think this is the perfect time for us to transition into characters. We've all been dreading it. I know, I know, I know. Talking about the characters Dread of the film, run, run from, from it. it. Characters still arrive. <laughs> Truly, they do. Indeed, they do. And I think we need to start, obviously, with Benedict Cumberbatch's Doctor Stephen Strange. Because, and here's what I'll say, maybe this is a hot take, and this obviously comes down to subjective liking a character, liking an actor in a role or not. But I think that, you know, obviously, for with Stephen Strange, they're going very much for a narcissist, sociopath, Tony Stark-esque kind of character, where he's an asshole... He, he's mean to a lot of people. He thinks he's the goddamn hottest shit to walk the, to walk God's green earth, and he gets humbled, uh, and and that that's the beginning of his character arc. But I also think that he, to a lesser extent, they don't. Tony Stark has the crutch of be being Robert Downey Jr. or being Robert Downey Jr. and having that Robert Downey Jr. snark to him. They really play up the quipping and the snarky the snarkiness of Tony Stark and things like that. I think they still do that with Stephen Strange, but to a lesser extent, which I think and he, he comes out obviously being a less iconic character. But I think it is impressive that they can, um, you know, accomplish this character arc nonetheless without that sort of that snarkiness, I suppose. I mean, I, I, I just think I can't necessarily agree with that because for me, his character arc feels rather bare bones. It's hmm. guy, it's, uh, arrogant guy is humbled. And, and so from that degree, I can't really find it impressive that they were able to do it because like, I, I feel like this this sort of character arc, this sort of arrogant guy becomes humbled concept mm -hmm. has been done better in other places. And I think that been there, done that nature of our main character is what makes it so hard for me to connect to all the genuinely interesting concepts of Carmitage and learning magic and all that stuff. I think the lore is probably my favorite part of this movie outside of the CGI and the fights. Uh, but I, I don't really care to learn about it through the eyes of Stephen Strange because I feel like I've seen his character arc before and for me it feels kind of flat, like the simplest version of this kind of character mm. arc. Um, making him a surgeon, making him lose the control of his hands and his body and having to reorient his spirit, I think sounds good on, on paper, And I, but I think in execution, Benedict Cumberbatch is fine, but I think he's one of the less... Least, less, He's one of the less charismatic roles or leads in the MCU, and because he doesn't have that charisma, or or really the personality, or the iconic nature, or the character arc to support it, I really do feel like he he might be my least favorite protagonist. And not because I dislike Doctor Strange conceptually, mm -hmm. but just because what we have as the adaptation of Doctor Strange in the MCU, I think falls flat for me in so many regards. I, I have a hard time understanding why I'm supposed to care about Doctor Strange. And, and so then I don't. My, my problem with Doctor Strange is like, yeah, I get it. He's, he's as you're saying, Tanner, he's self-interested and he becomes humbled uh, mm -hmm. throughout the film. And okay, that's that's a good place to start from, right? I mean, yeah, yeah I, I do like the throwaway line about like him not wanting to help um, 
war machine. I thought that was kind of clever. Speaking of a few MCU ties, and like, oh, here's a guy in the fucking military suit. And it's certain... yeah. the thing is, though, is that, that not him? That, that's not war machine because the the timeline for Doctor Strange has always been kind of a uh, wispy. Where does it take place? Sure. But I think from what I understand, that that beginning section of the film takes place in like. 2012, 2013, oh. or something yeah. like that. Because he spends, like, five years in Carvatage. Yeah. I, I, I think that you know, people have theorized that, if you remember, I said this to Tucker, uh, if you remember back to Iron Man 2, when they showed the footage of all these different um, people trying to recreate the Iron Man suit, there's one where dude's trying it out, and then he gets twisted all the way around. Like, oh, and his yeah. torso goes 180. I think people have theorized that that's the person that they're talking about. Um, oh, but I coming see. after Civil War, it is confusing, and it probably seems like they're talking about Rhodey. Yeah. So, I don't know. Ultimately, I don't care. I, yeah. uh, here, here's, here's my Literally problem. a one-off line. <laughs> yeah. Here's my problem with him, right? He has no difficulty doing anything, and he seemingly can't really be touched. I, a, a great example is, like, we literally see him get stabbed in the heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's fine. And he, like he's got to do a cool fight scene to like fight for his life as Rachel McAdams is like bringing him back to life, right? But ultimately, he gets stabbed in the heart, and then she like stitches him up, and he's like, "Off to Hong Kong, right?" You know, mm-hmm. or it's, or it's, oh shoot, I can't make my portals because I think my problems with my hands. It couldn't possibly be with my mind. And, like fucking go to Mount Everest, figure this out, come back, and then boom! All of a sudden, he's fighting like a goddamn badass. He's learning every spell in the book. He's picking up the little thing where he goes, da 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 ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk He's picking up that little necklace, right? And he's just doing everything. Right away, he can fight like a fucking badass. He can't be killed by Matt Mickelson. He knows how to do all the spells. He's a Mary Sue. He is a Mary Sue. He's a Gary Stew, I believe. Oh, there yeah. you go. That's what let, me get, let me get the correct etymological terminology. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I just, just doesn't work for me. It's like I never feel any stakes from the character. And when you, when you combine it with a personality that I think is very wooden... I don't see any reason to connect to him beyond him doing his his hand tricks. Let me uh, let me let me pose this question here. This is a hypothetical question. Well, it's not a hypothetical question. It, it, <laughs> it's it's just a real a question. It's just a question. What do you guys feel is the? Uh, I'm going to use the word here, the famous BLB word. What is the categorical difference between Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Stephen Strange and Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark? Uh, Tucker Hazel. Uh, BLB B- 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 own Tucker Hazel. Yes, BLB's own Tucker Hazel. I think that the uh, way that Tony Stark is put into situations in in which his body is like... He doesn't have the ability of the mind of Doctor Strange to where he can astral project and not have to worry about his body mm-hmm. at all. It, in Iron Man 3, when he's strapped, stripped down without the suit and has to use his mind, in the original Iron Man, when he is given trapped on his chest and is stuck in a cave he's put into multiple situations where he only has his mind and so it feels more impressive that his mind is able to come up with these scenarios and also he's he's humbled through assistance of others which in this film i think is played into a very small degree where the ancient one is able to like no you don't know everything a couple of times Mm. but then he learns and then he knows everything like i feel like there isn't enough time to feel like he's he's in a situation that he actually has to think because it just ha- happens almost on a dime that he's yeah. able to fix these scenarios. I, I mean, I, I was taught a fair comparison. Uh, I think a fair comparison would be like Tony Stark, Iron Man one, St- Stephen Strange, this movie. Yeah. You know, so sure. But uh, let it be known that I am not saying that, uh, Stephen Strange is a better character than Tony Stark. Robert Downey Jr. as, to- as Tony Stark is obviously a, a far superior character. Uh, by design, a because superior he, Iron Man, I superior Iron Man, because that That's he is the main reference. character. He's the main character of the MCU one, and also Robert Downey Jr. is better for the role than. Uh, I feel like a lot of people probably could have played Doctor Strange, honestly. Uh, you know, sort of getting a getting a British prestige actor to to put on an American accent. Alec Guinness. Alec Guinness could have done it, of course. <laughs> Here's what I have to say about to, to your to your, to your prompt about category categoriality, Tanner. Yes, I think they're incomparable for okay. for basically every possible reason. I, I first of all, I just think that Robert Downey Jr. is way more charismatic, and I think yeah. charisma matters a lot here because the other thing is like, like Doctor Strange is just a fucking asshole. Like he just mm-hmm. is, right? He's just a mean. He's just mean to what, Rebecca. What's her name? Re- Rachel McAdams' character's name. Yeah, is... Angela. No, neither of those. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. 
Oh, she was a pretty big part in Multiverse of Madness. Oh, gosh. Oh, Dr. I, Christine I said Palmer. It, yeah, Christine. I said it. I was going to say, I said it earlier in the video. Okay. Yeah, it's Christine. Yeah. He's he just like, he's like, what am I going to do? Find meaning my life through you? Or, or, or like, oh, I don't want to help these people need. I just want to help somebody who makes me look cool and doesn't mess up my perfect record. Like, he is so obviously a douchebag. Mm -hmm. And then the best he can do later is like send angela an email right not her name my my feeling is like there i don't i don't feel like he he wins my approval as as an audience member ever mm. he he's mm. just again he's just this smarmy guy who can just do anything and and tony because the thing about tony stark right is that his he there was nuance to him because the stark industries the first film is about war profiteering and that's interesting. The shades of gray that that Stark Industries is operating in, right, makes him a doctor profiteering. <laughs> makes this him. The, this is about me the medical industry. Sure. Yeah. Not... Like like Saw Seven. Like Saw Seven, just like but, Saw Seven. But there is so much more nuance to like w to Tony's background than this, where it's yeah. blatantly in the script. I just do things that make me happy, and the film never lets a single character escape without telling Doctor Strange that his ego is getting in the way. <laughs> yeah, it's so I, I think, basic. I think... I, I think that is another one of the differences is he never really feels like he's humanized. I think that's what you're talking about. And I can't remember the words you said. It was, you know, it was, it was a minute ago. My, mm -hmm. my mind's already slipping. Uh, I'm going to come But uh, What's her name? <laughs> is, is Tony Stark has friends. He has genuine sure. relationships with people. The closest thing you get to a genuine relationship is with Christine Palmer, in which almost every scene that they have together, she's like, no, you treated me badly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Tony's got Rhodey. Tony's got an actual relationship with Pepper. Uh, but Happy Hogan, don't forget Happy Hogan. Oh, and, and Happy, yeah, of course, yeah. of course. But uh, you, I, I never really feel like, even with the side characters, which I think are even weaker than mm -hmm. Strange himself, as I want to get into, he, we're never given a, a balance for him. His his smarminess is only uh, balanced by people saying you're smarmy. <laughs> yeah. I think that you know, that that's probably a symptom of um, the MCU wanting to cr make Doctor Strange a lone wolf character. He doesn't have sure. an, uh, he doesn't have a team Iron Man behind him or, or what and whatnot. He is the Sorcerer Supreme, and he's sort of out on his own on, on this character journey uh, mm -hmm. sort of situation. But that's interesting that you say that because mm -hmm. I think that is true from a personality perspective. For, mm -hmm. But from a script perspective, I don't necessarily think that is true because. We spend a, a good amount of time with a lot of characters. There's a lot of supporting characters in mm -hmm. this film, but they never, n none of them really ever feel like they have a bond. He's got an ex girlfriend. Oh, yeah, well, I, that, take, I take that back. Wong. I forgot. I completely forgot Wong about Wong. Wong and is Mordo his friend. Yeah. And 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 uh, Angela, and, and the and uh, the ancient one. Like there are a lot of supporting characters for Doctor Strange that I feel like they want us to care about, but then he's always pushing them away so that we can never connect to them so they never like feel important to him because they're not so i i feel like it's a disconnect between the amount of times that he spends talking with characters versus his personality like the two are like at odds in my mind sure i don't know I mean, and this is yet to be seen because we're still getting dr strange movies and appearances and things like that it's you know we can look back on tony stark's character arc across you know uh 2008 to 2019 and see yeah. where it, see where it went and not what we also got much more regular appearances of Tony Stark to see where that character arc is going. So, uh, I, mean, I think, you know, it could be a thing of Doctor Strange does push people away. He is a narcissist. He does always want to be in control of the situation and, you know, m make the call that'll, you know, uh, kill half the universe or, you know, trap himself in a time loop for 40,000 years and use the time stone to break the laws of nature. He's always the one to make that call and we'll see where that character arc pay pays off, I suppose, sure. if it all makes sense in the end. I, I think it's pretty solid up until now. I can see your guys' criticisms, but I think the thing of him, you know, being a lone wolf and being smarmy and things like that are fine as they stand right now. Sure. What, one interesting thing that you said that just kind of made me think is mm -hmm. less frequent appearances. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting because mm -hmm. it is it is not true. We have had an appearance in a, a Doctor Strange in a, appear in a Marvel movie every year since he debuted, since, except for 2020. He was yes. in Ragnarok, he was in Infinity War, he was in Endgame, he was in No Way Home, he was in his sequel. Like, mm -hmm. he was he was in all these movies, but I think that that's interesting that you say that, because I, I agreed, like, of course, he doesn't feel as adopted, but I think it's interesting that 
he, he he's at his best when he's a side character. When yeah. he's the the uh, know it all character that our more personable characters are bouncing off of, and sure, he's yeah. bringing his mysticality to it. He's bringing his unique combat, but. I like him a lot in Infinity War, and of course, mm-hmm. not really a character in Endgame, though he does appear in that movie. Or Ragnarok, for that matter. We get sure, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think he's he's at his best in Infinity War and No Way Home. I think that's where he's he's used to his best, at least mm-hmm. in my opinion. I, I, I mean, the, obviously, it's a promotional tool to get people hyped up for Multiverse of Madness. But yeah. on Disney Plus, there's a whole category in the Marvel tab called movies featuring Doctor Strange, and it's fucking fall. Yeah, which is which is crazy. Um, but I agree with you. I think he works better as a side character because he's. I think he's one note, and and I think that his one noteness, it feels less frustrating when he's not leading a film. So Tanner, I I like Do- I like Doctor Strange. Mm-hmm. I just don't like Doctor Strange here, because here you have to really sit with him, right? Yeah. It, it's it's like when you got those friends at school in high school. You're great friends, or at lunch or something. But then sometimes you have to fucking have a car ride with them. Or you're just hanging out just the two of you. You're like, I don't have anything to say to this person. That's how I feel yeah, about Dr. Strange. That, I've had those friends, yeah, absolutely. When he's, when he's fucking Marvel's uncle, like like old Ben Kenobi on in Marvel's tattooing of New York City, mm-hmm. and you just visit him time and time again, I think that works. But Sure, yeah. Um, but Holy if we shit. do want to hop on the side characters quick before we are in a time crunch. God, here, I, I uh, want to. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Uh, but uh, before we give this uh, a rating, um, I think that she would tell Edge of War quietly gives one of the best supporting roles in the entire MCU. Yep, don't disagree. I think that, like, it's funny because his performance and his genuineness and his emotions absolutely comes through. You can see the skill of, it, of him as an actor. Mm-hmm. But I... I barely know anything about Mordo. I think like the only reason I think that he's one of the most interesting characters in this film is because he gives such a phenomenal performance and mm-hmm. you feel emotion from him, but not be. I really don't think because of the character he's playing, just because of the actor portraying it. Yeah, I agree. I see. I see the Stephen A. We don't. A. Stephen A. Smith. We don't care. We don't care. Gif in front of my eyes whenever he's on screen <laughs> because you're right. He 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 is again. Great actors. This movie has so many great actors. Mm-hmm. But but what is he to do? Michael Stuhlbarg, American hero, American gem, <laughs> treasure. The guy the guy who plays Javier in Modern Family. Uh, I don't know who that one is. He, he's the guy who's at the basketball court when Doctor Strange. Oh, Benjamin goes. Bratt. I don't know. No, no. The... When Doctor Strange goes to just harass a guy that he refused medical treatment to at the basketball court to yeah. find Comertage, that is Javier from Modern Family. Okay, yeah, Benjamin Bratt. Is, is uh, the actor's name. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Pangborn. <laughs> yes, Pangborn. Yeah. Um, and Tilda Swinton, pretty pretty fine. I mean, all, about on the level of everyone else that we're talking about here in terms of characterization, I think I think she turns in a good performance. Sure. Yeah. 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 I, I think that she might be the one that disappoints me the most, though. Not because she's not getting a great performance, but because I think that the Ancient One ha- is maybe the most interesting character to me in this mm. film in terms of she does have this sort of darkness to her character of she will do anything and she has this experience and is insanely powerful and like but is very cool about it i think that Mm -hmm. that makes her pretty compelling uh but unfortunately we really only ever see her through the eyes of Stephen strange and for a lot of their interactions he is like like it does we don't really get to get a sense of her character because, she, because she's intended to be mysterious and no one fucking knows her age or anything about her and stuff like that. But no. I wish that they didn't know anything about her, but we did. You know what I'm saying? Mm, sure. Yeah, when yeah. I think of Tilda Swinton, I see the Stephen A. Smith. We don't care. We don't oh, care. Yeah. Oh, that's a really great, that's a really great quip, Abram. I'm, I'm glad you came up with that one here. <laughs> but but my thing with Tilda Swinton is I think she's so cool. Like she's mm-hmm. fighting with the, with the fucking fans, you know? She's slitting that guy's throat with a fan. How cool is that, right? Yeah. But I, it, it's a problem of screen time. We, we have these big revelations about her off, like when it's just fucking Mordo and Doctor Strange chewing the fat, if you will. And then the next time we see the Ancient One, she's got the symbol on her forehead, and Mordo goes, oh, damn it. Magic makes him look right. And then no! And, and, and again, it, it, I agree with Tucker. Like, if we could see, like, fucking brute, like, over her fucking bitch's pot cooking up the, the dark dimension stuff <laughs> to give herself more life, I would mm-hmm. care a little bit more. But again, sure. it's show me these things make me interested. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have more things to say, but of course, we have to get to everyone's favorite part of the show, 
where we, f we first we asked if Abram watched the post credit scenes. I did not watch the post credit scenes. Abram, there are two post credit scenes. Can two you the remember what they are? Post credit scenes in the MCU. No opinion. editorializing, Tucker. No editorializing. <laughs> one of the post credit. What they are. One of the post credit scenes is going to be about the cape. The, no, no, he gets the cape already. If you remember. No, not the cape. Just like doing something cute, like quaffing his hair or something. No. No, no, doesn't that doesn't. Does happen. it have to do with Wong? No, no Wong in either of them. Um, it's after the Thanos. No mm -hmm. Thanos in either of them. You, talk, uh, Abram, take the first two letters of Thanos' name. That that that's a hint. This is this is a this is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> Thor. Thor. What's the movie that came out after Doctor Strange? Well, it would. It, it, Guardians <laughs> two. Contextual. Guardians. Con, con, contextual. The movie that we brought suggest. up in this video. Contextual clues that suggested the next film releases. Thor Ragnarok. But that's it's, not true. It that's not true. <laughs> but yeah, it's the next appearance of Doctor Strange. Is, is it's the just... next one Ant-Man and the Wasp? <laughs> no, it's just, it's, just, it's just a scene from Thor, Thor Ragnarok where he's like, I'll help you find Odin or whatever. Uh, right. And the second one, Abram, the second one features <laughs> Javier from Modern Family. Are they playing he's basketball? Back. He's not playing <laughs> basketball. <laughs> he, he's more, more, it's similar. It's getting murdered. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, just, he does well, get no. murdered at the end. Because yeah. he, or does he? Mordo just Mordo's saying no more sorcerers. And he's too many us... sorcerers. Too many sorcerers. Too many sorcerers. I, also... I, I turned it into the fucking. Uh, so did I. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he... Mordo's going around stealing people's magic, um, which is, uh, as far as we can tell, the only plot line from Phase Three that has yet to be resolved. And will it ever be resolved? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But we're fucking hopping with Clea into the dark dimension, the fucking third one. So hey, maybe the... he'll show up in House of Harkness, coming to Disney Plus in 2024. Is do we ever see Mordo be a villain in the MCU? No, uh, he's yeah, just kind of like angry at the end of this movie, and then because he's in Multiverse of Madness, we show up at the Sanctum, and he's like, "Oh fuck, it's Mordo," but he's friends. But then they're friends, yeah, yeah. And so having having fallen asleep during this film the first time, I was like, "Oh shit." I bet that Mordo's gonna be the villain of the third act because of that thing they said in the next movie. But I guess that's just not true. It, and now here's a question for you as we're putting in scores. Christine Palmer, any relation to Arnold? No, yes. granddaughter. God, that would be the that'd be an exciting plus credit scene if Arnold Palmer <laughs> shows up. Okay, shall we, folks? Is Arnold, yeah. is Arnold Palmer alive? Because if not, Doctor Strange could do that chick, 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 thing to bring him back. Three, home. two, one. All right, there it is. Look at this. Uh, running down the scores here, let's go from the bottom to top. Uh, Abram gave this film a 5.2, Tucker gave this film a 6.0, and I gave this film a 7.7. .7. That averages out to a 6.3 average rating, placing this film, place number 16, uh, above the first Thor movie and below Ant-Man. Yeah, that feels right for me. That feels yeah. right. Just, just in the middle of these, uh, th these sort of, uh, eh, eh, origin story films, you know? Mm -hmm. I yeah. Th yeah. God, do we have to watch Guardians of the Galaxy two next? If we do, I'm very excited to watch that. I, I really think that I'm, I'm, I can give it another, another shot. Um, but who, who knows? Maybe I'll still think it's meant. I'm really, I'm really excited for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Very excited to rewatch this one. Me too. Um, I love this movie. And with that, folks, that'll do us. That'll do us here for our Doctor Strange review. Let us know down in the comments or in the Discord server what your thoughts on Doctor Strange are. But next time, we'll be talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So, we'll see you then. Bye.